All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. The, uh, this session here is about diagnostic modalities and imaging, so we'll talk about echo, CT, and uh, cardiac MRI, and the session after that will be about valvular heart disease, so I think you're gonna uh, have really a good overview of uh, also cardiology, some of the testing, and other disease states. So let me take on echocardiography, uh, probably the most common diagnostic modality, and I know we've addressed a bit of that this morning. And let me share with you where are we in the field and what you should do as a practitioner or nurse or healthcare professional in this field. It really is amazing that the same principle that this field started with back in the 50s is still the same, but the technology has improved so much that it's not only that you can locate where various, you know, depth is of where the valve, where the, where the myocardium is, but also you can uh, nowadays with Doppler technique uh, look at velocity so we can address what the, how fast are the red cells going into the cardiac chambers. And if you know how fast the, cardi the red cells are going into the cardiac chambers, you can tell flow dynamics, you can calculate cardiac output, you can also using some equations, Bernoulli equation that you don't have to remember, uh, measure pressure, that's how you can get that. Uh, with 3D nowadays, you could you know, take a look at the heart in 3D, see valves in all their structure. There is a field of contrast echo, and at times we'll ask you to do contrast because if the images are not so pristine, contrast can help us look at the myocardium and uh, basically evaluate what, uh, what the heart looks like. So the purpose of these 15 minutes is to give you an overview of where can you use it, when should you order a test, and hopefully when not to order a test, because headache is not a good indication for an echocardiogram. <laughs> Blurred vision is not. A change in mood is not an indication, but unfortunately, most other things that relate to the heart could be an indication. And where we see an issue is repeated studies. Uh, so, in general, these are the common use. So if I want to know what the size of this heart is, I see a chest x-ray would tell me maybe possible cardiomegaly, or you're wondering whether the heart size is big, this is a great technology to do. Uh, since it is real time, it can tell you about diastole and systole and what the function is. You know about the ejection fraction, this famous EF that at times trainees want to know before even having seen a patient and hopefully you know you'll revert this trend <clears throat> valve disease very big pericardial effusion atrial fibrillation mostly for left atrial size and with transesophageal echocardiography i know you know about tee versus a regular echocardiogram regular echocardiogram is you do it with the transducer on the surface a transesophageal echocardiogram, you put a probe with the same technology, but you put it through the esophagus to look at the heart. And the reason for that, and we'll go through it, is you don't have interference from the chest wall. The images are much more pristine. It's not indicated for every patient, but the base of the heart, that where the left atrium, left atrial appendage, where clots occur, this is the best technology for that. Endocarditis, stroke peripheral embolization, aortic dissection. Okay, so that's in general you know, basically heart and vascular issues. Now, LV function, left ventricular function, evaluation of somebody with, did they have a previous myocardial infarction, yes or no? What is the function, systolic function, ejection fraction? This is the technology that is used as first line, always wherever you are in the world. And this is an example of an apical infarct. You could see it very nicely here of this apex of the heart as opposed to this nice normal is not functioning well, is not thickening. That's the property of the heart. Property of the heart is to thicken and relax. Contract and relax for every beat. And hopefully that's what we have all of us here in this room. Uh, LV dimension, LV hypertrophy. If somebody has hypertension, that's a great indication to see. It's almost like your hemoglobin A1C of diabetes, right? 
if somebody, you're wondering whether about their blood pressure control and they have hypertrophy and they increase LV mass, you know that most likely this blood pressure is not very well controlled, okay? Now, newer things for you. You're not gonna be worried about this, but nowadays we have 3D technology. So from 3D technology, you could evaluate better volumes and ejection fraction, particularly when people have a lot of regional abnormalities in this heart. The other thing that has also evolved over the past few years is what we call strain imaging, is how much thickening or deformation is occurring to the heart. All this, what you see, is automated in front of you. So we don't have to do anything except automate it and get beautiful pictures. And you could see that each area of this heart can be quantitated as opposed to this heart where you have a, a, almost an apical aneurysm, basically. And you could quantitate this region, which is much better than all the others. So where do we use it? We use it to you know, emphasize what we interpret like, but nowadays in cardio-oncology, which is an evolving field, we look at this global longitudinal strain before individuals are taking, you know, chemotherapeutic drugs that can affect the heart. So this is where we use it most of the time. So a few things about when do we assess left ventricular function with an echocardiogram. Old myocardial infarction, a EF is a very powerful indicator as to prognosis and survival. Chest pain, resting echo, as Mark Quinones told you this morning, just a pure rest echo. If you're not suspecting something else going on, if somebody has you know, chest wall pain coming to you and said every time it's positional, you can get an echocardiogram. It's not going to help you. It's going to be normal most of the time unless there's something else going on. This may our heart failure very important you know, to, to assess whether it's a systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. You have an abnormal electrocardiogram, cardiomegaly by chest x-ray, systemic hypertension we talked about, cardiotoxic drug, chemotherapy, prior to major surgery, not every time, right? Just like Dr. Solomon told you, that in patients who are asymptomatic, don't need any, they don't need any testing. They're functional, they're doing well, they don't need any testing, okay? So in chest pain, a resting echo is often of no diagnostic value unless there is something else an acute MI, unstable angina, pericarditis, suspected aortic dissection, and even for an aortic dissection, a transthoracic echocardiogram, the sensitivity of detecting that is really not high unless it's an evolving aortic group. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, abnormal electrocardiogram. For detection of coronary disease, a stress echocardiogram as opposed to a resting echocardiogram would be certainly much better. Now, I wanted to share with you here uh, in patients with heart failure, how can an echocardiogram help you? And it can help you in many ways. You could take a look at the heart itself and infer the underlying etiology. On this one is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You see how thick this septum is, and you have the SAM, this obstruction, dynamic obstruction. Look at this heart. All these patients have shortness of breath, but imaging can help you hone down as to what's the underlying problem. This is a congestive cardiomyopathy. The heart is much bigger, barely contracting. This is an infiltrative disease with amyloid. You see the heart thicker. You can't tell it is really amyloid just by looking at the heart, but you as a clinician would look at the electrocardiogram, which has basically low voltage, and you see this hypertrophy with the glistening kind of uh, uh, look to it and you suspect amyloid, at least we'll tell, you know, most likely infiltrative disease versus somebody who had a previous infarction. You could see that this septum is not functioning well compared to the posterior wall, much less thickening in this compared to this one here. So what do we use it in heart failure for? You use it to assess LV function, determine the etiology just like as much as possible, right? Is it systolic, diastolic, or can we help you further? Uh, detect pulmonary hypertension, and, uh, and evaluate prognosis. And we can also estimate what cardiac output is, knowing what the velocity is like, knowing what the cross-sectional area of flow, so we go through some formulas and come up with a cardiac output for you. The other big thing is actually, to tell you the truth, this was <clears throat> first published uh, 20, 21 years ago by Dr. Naga, one of our associates, who is a big specialist in, in diastolic heart failure. And this is using tissue Doppler, so we marry tissue Doppler 
of the tissue itself with what's going on in the mitral inflow and try to predict pulmonary capillary wedge pressure completely non-invasively with Equidopper techniques. And that, I think, has you know, taken over uh, in the whole country and the world of how do you evaluate diastolic function uh, in patients with Equidopper. The other thing is that you see on the reports, and at times you need that, if somebody have pulmonary disease or there's some right ventricular issues, you say, what is the pulmonary RA pressure like? And we can evaluate that non-invasively by looking at the tricuspid regurgitation, even a tiny jet, and using you know, a, the modified Bernoulli equation to estimate the right ventricular systolic pressure from the velocity of the TR, as well as an estimate of right atrial pressure. And I think that's very helpful clinically to see whether somebody has pulmonary hypertension and how bad the pulmonary hypertension, instead of putting a right heart catheterization, is one gas catheter, just like we've done in the past. <clears throat> Pericardial disease is very important. And this, you have a constrictive effusive pericarditis on this patient. You could see where the pericardial fluid is here, anteriorly as well as posteriorly. And I think this is very important going forward in patients that you're suspecting pericarditis <clears throat> or constrictive pericarditis. A big evaluation and, and utilization of echocardiography is valvular heart disease. And we talked about that with Doppler, you can evaluate what the velocity is across this tiny aortic valve, and this is aortic stenosis. So whenever you have narrowing of, an, of a valve, the velocity accelerates significantly, so we can estimate a gradient, calculate the valve area, and it's also used for regurgitation lesion. So this is aortic regurgitation, this is mitral regurgitation. Basically, in general, you need an echocardiogram. It is the first line modality. And to evaluate murmurs, evaluate how severe the stenosis or regurgitation is. Uh, you want to assess suitability for valve procedures, TAVR, etc. Basically, valvular heart disease is really big. Now, I talked briefly about transthoracic versus transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, transesophageal is a procedure, semi-invasive, you want to call it. You know, basically, you have an IV, and it's almost like a gastroenterologist, but you're looking at the heart at the base of the heart. Why do we use it? We use it in areas where we need better definition. Prosthetic valves, I think, is going to be important if there is any endocarditis. Left atrial appendage clots, and this is an example for you. Actually, is a patient of mine just three weeks ago, and we're going to bring him back after anticoagulation. And he's lucky in a way because you see this clot. There shouldn't be anything in there, and this clot is moving. And it is, has, it's almost like sitting on a bomb. This individual is very lucky not to have an embolic phenomenon. And, you know, misdiagnosed about just, you know, having pneumonia, but had actually heart failure with a atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, very fast. So TEE will give you a high resolution. This is an endocarditis. See, this is the mitral valve here, left atrium. And this is this big vegetation when you see the little tentacles, the little pedunculation from this, a very high echogenic and, and uh, has, has uh, you know, a lot of embolic uh, possibilities of, of this. And when, when do we need it? Well, if you have a, if you have on your transthoracic study, if you have a vegetation already that is diagnostic, you really don't need it unless you're looking for complications, okay? But if I'm suspicious of that and I need a better resolution of it, then uh, you know, we use do a transesophageal echocardiogram, all right? So low probability, you don't need it. High probability, but I'm not seeing anything. Prosthetic valves, definitely you need a transesophageal to help you out. And also an, an echo is important to look at complications of people who have heart failure or previous infarction. This is a huge clot in the atrium that you could see there from every image that you could see. And I think, you know, a transthoracic is very important in this situation. Now, Dr. Soleiman mentioned a few things, and Dr. Quinones also mentioned a few things. I really think there's an overutilization of echocardiograms. Every time somebody thinks of an operation, any operation, they get an echocardiogram. You know, we here to be stewards of our healthcare system. Yes, it will bring money to us, to the hospital, if you're to do it. But you're going you're gonna to use these resources appropriately. Yes, it's not invasive. Yes, there's no contrast. There's no... If somebody is going for a cataract surgery, you don't need an echocardiogram, okay? And to tell you the truth, 
people were doing stress nuclear studies for cataract surgery. All right? And you're, you're, you're wondering, but this is the truth. And so there are indications for it, right? Routine pre-op check is not an indication, obviously, if somebody has shortness of breath, heart failure, et cetera. And this to, you know, marry what I'm telling you about. <laughs> it, it is a changing world. And the one in the middle, you know, you, you could belong to one or the other. It doesn't matter, uh, uh, groups. But we are the stewards for this healthcare system. And we have to be knowledgeable as what what to use, what's appropriate for us to use, be it echo or anything else, and I'm not talking about echocardiography only, is everything. And this is the growth in advanced imaging. Cardiology on the left, overall. Overall for you, internist, ophthalmologist, intensivist, whatever it is, it is going exponential. Now it's almost leveling off, but it's still growing, and you could blame that on so many ways. However, the American College of Cardiology came up with appropriate use criteria for us to look at appropriateness of various testing. Stress testing, initially diagnostic testing, stress nuclear, echo, MRI, and later, more recently, as to when do you do a PCI procedure? When do you put a stent? When do you do surgery? When do you do a mitral valve repair? Dr. Lowry is here and he'll talk about mitral valve repair. I think these are very important for us to discuss, right? Because it is very important to do appropriate things on patients, hopefully they benefit. And what's the definition of appropriate use criteria? An appropriate study is one that, with the expected incremental information combined with clinical judgment, you know, something that we're losing one way or another, exceeds the expected negative consequences by sufficient wide margin that the procedure is generally considered acceptable. So these are the things that are not cost effective. They're not necessarily good to get an echocardiogram. A routine checkup. Yeah, somebody who's asymptomatic has no signs of heart disease, nothing, okay? Routine checkup. There's no routine checkup. Ambulatory patient with recurrent chest pain with no specific abnormalities on physical exam, chest x-ray, EK, everything is normal. This is resting echocardiogram. If you need to do a stress test for whatever reason, yeah, yes. Patient with palpitation without an identifiable arrhythmia, normal everything else. Elderly patient strokes with whom anticoagulation is already integrated. You know, they have atrial fibrillation, and, you know, th there's, there's no need to do another one if you've already done one. And I think most of the abuses have been repeated studies. You know, you do one, and then after three, four days, you get another request. And after a month, you get another request. So think about this utilization and people with innocent murmurs. So concluding remarks. One, know what specific information you're looking at. And four, how will the results change your diagnostic workup. And now you have choices of various things, right? So you're gonna have to decide whether should I do a stress or beware of order sets. Order sets are easy for us because we can have, at least it will remind us. But uncheck it if this is not appropriate. And hopefully these order tests would put the ones that are most commonly indicated, most commonly appropriate for that diagnosis. Know the limitations of the test you're ordering. And if in doubt, ask an expert. And I think we're all here, you know, to, to help you suggest. If I don't know what to order from a radiological things for either abdomen or I call a radiologist, and I think you should call a cardiologist to figure out what test to order. And this is our team in the imaging. I think Janet is here, Janet Champagne. She's uh, our manager for all cardiovascular imaging services. A great team, really unique here at Houston Methodist. And why? Because all these imaging modalities are under one umbrella. Uh, in the country, they're all over the place, some in radiology, some in cardiology. And, uh, and I really think that that's the breadth that we pride ourselves with, is, is to try to order and get the most appropriate study on the appropriate patient. Thank you very much for your attention.